Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Sam Clark, and uh, I work for TransAid, and I'm the transport technical lead for this project. I'd like to welcome all of you to the virtual launch of our research project, the full, full title of which is An Investigation into the Impact on Social Inclusion of High-Volume Transport Corridors and Solutions to Identifying and Preventing Human Trafficking. And uh, the specific geographic focus for this project is Uganda and Tanzania. I just wanted to thank you in advance for giving up your time to be with us today. We'll try to stick to time as far as we possibly can. Um, our speakers today will be Cathy Green, our team lead, Kim van der Veerd, the team's senior researcher, and Damon Wamara, who many of you will know from the Ugandan Child Networks NGO, uh, Child Rights Network, uh, NGO Network. Other members from the project team who are here to answer your questions include Neil Retty, our transport specialist, Jacob Odiambo, our m and &E specialist, and Eva Mwai, our stakeholder engagement specialist. We'd like to encourage you to share comments and questions uh, throughout the event today. And you can do so by looking for the chat option uh, and typing your question or comment in, and then making sure you click send. Unfortunately, there's no mechanism to actually verbally ask questions today. We will make sure that we get answers to you for, for all, of, all, the, all of the questions that come in. Um, if you're on an iPad or an Apple device, uh, it might be slightly different. There should be either a question mark uh, somewhere on your screen to click into or the equivalent, uh, like an air bubble box or something like that. Um, so we've allotted time at the end of this session uh, to answer as many of your questions as possible. And any that we don't get to in time, we'll respond uh, by email. So we'll make sure they are all answered. Um, it's important here to note that we want this process to be as collaborative as possible. We've been impressed with how many of you working in this field have been so open and willing to share information over the last few weeks. And it's certainly our intention to adopt the same approach going so going forward please at any point feel free to contact uh, any of the team and with that i'd like to start the event i'm going to introduce you to kathy green our team lead who will share with you some more detail about the project over to you kathy Thanks very much, Sam. Next slide, please. So um, just a brief outline of today's session. Uh, we're going to start with some background um, of, about the research. Uh, we'll be looking at the objectives and the application of the research, um, a quick look at the phases and the timelines, and then we'll home in on uh, some of the findings of the literature review that we've taken uh, undertaken in recent weeks. Uh, we'll then move on to the implications of the literature review findings and consider next steps for our research project. And then we have a special guest um, to make some concluding comments. And um, the final part of today's session will be a question and answer session, um, as Sam has just outlined. Next slide, please. So, in relation to background, um, our research is funded by the UK Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office uh, through the High Volume Transport Applied Research Programme. So this is a programme that runs from 219 to 223, so it's a four-year programme. Um, the programme is managed by IMC Worldwide, and our research is implemented by a consortium led by Cardno Emerging Markets. So Cardno is a global infrastructure, environment and social development organisation with a very strong transport focus. Um, the consortium partners are TransAid, a UK development organisation working on transport safety and rural transport solutions. We have North Star Alliance, which provides quality healthcare to mobile workers in East Africa and other parts of Africa. And then also Scriptoria, a specialist research and communications organisation. So we are the consortium that are implementing this research. So the research fits with the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office's policy and regulation research priority. It focuses on long distance strategic road transport, 
um, and from a social inclusion perspective. So um, I just wanted to go through a few definitions before we um, look further at the research. So we're looking at high volume transport corridors, other major trade routes and border crossings linked to those routes. So our definition or our working definition of a high volume road is a highway that has uh, traffic volumes of more than 300 vehicles per day. Um, and also when we talk about transport corridors, really we're describing the flow of people and goods along a highway. And sometimes we find that traffic um, or transport corridor is used interchangeably um, with the term trade corridor, so a route that facilitates trade. Um, in relation to long distance transport operators, um, they are the, the key focus of our research. We're looking at heavy goods vehicle drivers and passenger service vehicle drivers, so primarily bus and coach drivers. But we're also looking at transport operators who undertake short distance journeys along the, um, the, the corridors and the routes, um, and that could include Boda Boda drivers or other commercial car hire operators. Next slide, please. So our uh, research objectives, um, there are four key objectives. Um, the first is to investigate the role played by high volume transport corridors in human trafficking. Um, and our two research study countries are Tanzania and Uganda. We're gonna be looking at some of the factors um, that are contributing to human trafficking along these high volume transport corridors. Um, and our major focus there is on transport related factors and regulatory factors. We're going to be looking at the level of awareness of human trafficking and its impacts amongst the transport providers who use those routes and, and amongst the communities through which the routes pass. Um, and then finally, we want to identify and pilot innovations that can help identify and counter human trafficking along the high volume transport corridors. So in terms of applications, um, our aim is to generate new high quality research um, and also to ensure uptake of the research by policymakers, practitioners and development partners. And to achieve that, we really need to place research users at the center of the research. So what do we hope to achieve from this research? Um, Firstly, greater policy attention to the role of transport sector um, actors um, in human trafficking. Second, to strengthen national human trafficking prevention strategies. And then thirdly, we'd really like to see the practical applications of our research being scaled up to other countries within sub-Saharan Africa eventually, um, since um, so many countries in this region and face a, a very severe human trafficking challenge. Next slide, please. So in terms of phases and timeline, um, this is a 22 month project divided into first uh, five phases. Um, we're in the first phase at the moment, which is uh, the inception phase. Uh, we then move into um, research preparation and then the implementation of our primary research so that phase three starts in January um, and ends in July 2021. Phase four is where we design and um, implement a pilot intervention. Um, and phase five has a big focus on uptake and embedment. So a strong, strong focus there on dissemination um, of our research findings and the findings of the, um, the innovation. Next slide, slide please. So at the moment we're in phase one, which is the inception phase. Um, we focused so far on doing a stakeholder mapping exercise. Uh, we've undertaken a desk-based literature review. And we have a project launch, which is what is happening today. Um, and we're starting to prepare for the next phase, um, which is preparation for the uh, research. And that involves looking at um, getting a research license, ethical approval, et cetera. Next slide, please. So, next slide, please. In terms of uh, stakeholder mapping, um, what we've done here um, as a desk uh, research exercise, we've identified relevant organizations and individuals. 
Um, and we've also sourced contacts um, through our existing contacts. Um, we've grouped stakeholders together to try and understand their different perspectives. Um, so as you can see here, there's an example of the stakeholders that we've got um, from Tanzania. They're group, grouped under government, um, civil society organization, and private sector. And we've also grouped together transport sector stakeholders. So this is transport associations, transport or driver training schools, um, CSOs and NGOs that have a transport focus. So some of our key, key questions are, which stakeholders can assist with information? Which can assist with contacts? Which um, will be the end users of our research? Um, and which stakeholders might want to be involved in the detailed design of our primary research? Next slide, please. Um, so, as you can see here, we apologise for the very small um, font used here, but this um, is an example of the stakeholders that we've um, grouped together for, for Uganda into the, the same categories. Next slide, please. So, I'm going to hand over now to my colleague, uh, Kim van der Vader, who's going to um, look at the literature review that we've undertaken. Um, she's going to um, present the methodology used and also some of the headline findings. Over to you, Kim. Thanks very much, Kathy, and good morning to everyone. Uh, go ahead, next slide, please. So our team embarked on a systemic literature review, and the primary focus of this review was very much on the roles and factors associated with transport um, as it relates to human trafficking and primarily for the formal literature review we focused on EBSCO host and we used EBSCO in a JSTOR. Uh, however, we quickly realized that uh, a lot of the literature is uh, available um, relating to trafficking in persons is grey literature. So we also complemented that with Google Scholar and Google and uh, we used many of the contacts um, that you saw earlier as well to, to gather um, any kind of published grey literature um, from uh, multilateral and, and other organizations that we've worked with. And we tried to focus on uh, the most recent literature, so that stemming from 2013 and later, um, to try and, and keep um, relatively up to date. Next slide, please. So you'll see here uh, an overview of the approach that we used for our literature. Uh, search. So we ended up finding approximately 181 um, pieces of relevant literature, um, after which the screening process and, and removing duplicates, we ended up with 127. Um, but what's important to note here is that really only 30 to 31 of those had a, a focus on transport and human trafficking. And so we clearly, uh, we quickly realized that there was a bit of a gap in the literature as to how much is reported on, on transport aspects. Um, and then in addition to those 3031, there was also, of course, the, the legislation, um, international, regional, and national that, that did also mention transport to some, to some extent. Next slide, please. So I'll take you through some of the, the key questions that we asked in our literature review. Um, the first of which is, what is the exact scale of human trafficking in Uganda and Tanzania? Um, which is a very highly contested question. Um, you'll see here on the slide that the criminal justice system of Uganda and Tanzania found uh, had recorded 455 and 161 victims of human trafficking in 2019, respectively. Um, however, uh, we found uh, various different numbers uh, in other reports, such as the Global Slavery Index, which was released by the Walk Free Foundation. So they reported that there was an S over 300,000 victims estimated within each country. Um, so that is quite a difference. Um, and we also read that um, within Uganda, for example, even the police estimate that there are um, perhaps 50 trafficked persons per day within the country. Um, and a lot of the, the trafficking is thus going unreported, uh, which could be due to numerous factors. Um, 
Uh, it could be that a large part of the, for example, domestic trafficking is hidden uh, within the country. Um, and also there are different cultures within each country. Uh, if we take Uganda, for example, the fostering of children to family and friends uh, is something that traffickers do take advantage of, uh, is something we found in the, in the literature. Um, and also, for example, child sacrifice is something uh, that might not uh, be recorded or might be seen as something other than trafficking. Next slide, please. Um, so to set the scene a little bit for, for some of our transport stakeholders, especially who might not be as familiar with, uh, with human trafficking, these are some of the types of, of human trafficking that are taking place within these two countries. Um, so the end result of the trafficking. Um, and it was very varied uh, across both countries. Um, and some specific cases were specific to each country. For example, trafficking for war was something that was found in literature to be associated with Uganda. Um, then also important to note is that much of the human trafficking is hidden. And so it is unclear what the ultimate situation is really and, and what is most prevalent within, within each country. Uh, next slide, please. So one thing that was mentioned quite frequently relating to transport in the literature was the routes that were taken um, within each country. And you can see here, we've tried to, to map some of these in, in tables. Um, and in the blue squares, this is an example of Tanzania, is the, um, you know, what role each country plays within the routes. So Tanzania is a source destination and transit uh, country. And I won't take you through the entire entire table, but you can see that in terms of transnational trafficking, uh, there are varied tra destinations. So not just on the African continent, but also beyond. Um, and it is also uh, considered a, a destination country, um, also from across uh, not just the African continent, but also beyond. And domestic routes, we did notice, was mostly from rural to the urban context. Next slide, please. And so this is the same table, but then for Uganda, uh, again, same trends, very varied um, destinations for those coming from Uganda um, across the world. Uh, and also uh, in terms of source countries, they're coming from many different destinations to Uganda as well. And we saw the same trend in the, in the domestic uh, situation that um, many trafficking takes place from rural to more urban settings. And one important thing to note here is that of course, the routes taken um, by traffickers is very complex and it is changing all the time. Uh, it depends, you know, which networks are available to them and, and what the current situation is um, of, that, of that moment in time. So I think that this is something within literature that is documented, but um, also we need to stay aware that this is, is, is varied and could be different in, in the current context. Next slide, please. So our team did um, a deep dive into the legislation that is available around trafficking in persons, and we focused on international, regional, and national legislation. And so I'll just take you through a few of the, of the key ones that we found. And just to note, we did try and focus on identifying as well legislation that mentioned trafficking in persons and transport. Um, unfortunately, a lot of legislation mentioned trafficking, but uh, not transport or transport act. So that was quite an interesting um, outcome of our of our literature search. And one of the most prominent ones that came across in the literature was the Palermo Protocol. Um, so that's the one that we're looking at now, um, released in 2000, uh, and is the protocol to prevent, suppress, and punishing and punish the trafficking of persons, um, especially women and children. And you can see here that there is quite a good mention of um, of a transport within this within this protocol. Um, so state signatories are, um, for those who signed on to this protocol, are required to understand the role of transport and transport operators as it relates to trafficking in persons. And they're also expected to put in place measures to prevent transport operated by commercial carriers being used in trafficking in person activities. Uh, and then that is the responsibility of the transport companies to ensure that the staff are able to check um, passengers' travel documentation, um, which 
goes hand in hand with having that training available to their staff in order to determine um, if documentation is authentic and, and complete. So that was um, definitely an interesting takeaway. There has been other um, very critical protocols and conventions um, on trafficking in person, such as the CEDAW, um, the Convention on the Worst Forms of Child Labor, Convention on the Rights of the Child, um, that all have mentioned trafficking, but uh, these had not mentioned transport. So um, this is the most uh, relevant to us at the moment. Next slide, please. And so looking at a more regional context, so there is a bill um, that is currently waiting ascension by the heads of the state. Uh, and it's a very uh, significant bill um, in, in that what we found in legislation, as it does have a very large focus on transport. And this is the 2016 EAC counter trafficking in persons bill. So some of the significant um, mentions of transport within this bill are that commercial transport companies whose vehicles are involved in human trafficking are legally liable. Um, and that the transport carriers should be taking steps to prevent the involvement of their staff in human trafficking. So again, bringing back up that staff training, code of conduct, um, and somehow monitoring staff. Um, it states that it is an inadequate defense to say that there's a lack of awareness among transport companies or their staff around trafficking in persons. Um, and it's also the responsibility of transport companies to ensure that passengers have that correct documentation when they're crossing borders. Um, and the consequences of not um, having doing of not doing so and, and being a part of trafficking in persons is that transport carriers can be asked to forfeit their vehicles. So that is um, quite a significant um, legislation that we're following very closely. Next slide, please. Uh, so Tanzania and Uganda have both uh, implemented their their own um, acts relating to trafficking in persons. So uh, these national legislations are are very critical as well to our research um, and to the response of the countries. And you can see here in Tanzania, they introduced one in 2008, the Enter Trafficking in Persons Act. Um, so they state a few things relating to transport. The first being that uh, drivers or other staff transporting trafficked persons are liable to prosecution um, and that there's actually not even a need for prosecutors to prove that the driver or staff used threat, force or coercion when transporting victims of trafficking. So their involvement is enough um, to be prosecuted with. Um, however, the role of transport companies is not specifically mentioned in the bill um, and so it's unclear to what degree of responsibility an employer uh, would be held accountable if their um, staff or vehicles was involved in trafficking in persons. Next slide, please. In Uganda, so they released a bill, um, an act one year later in 2009, Prevention of Trafficking in Persons Act. And here we find that drivers or other staff can be fined or imprisoned or both if they're involved in trafficking in persons. And they grade their offenses um, according to uh, the number of times that they've been committed. So the first offense um, is generally a fine, uh, relatively small in our um, opinion, which is uh, approximately 500 um, British pounds. But however, a second time offender will face imprisonment um, for seven years. So this is definitely a more significant um, repercussion. And whether or not the consent of a victim um, is given is irrelevant. There's also uh, applies to parental consent. So transporters will be prosecuted if they are at all involved in um, human trafficking. And the transport companies as well can be fined and closed if they're involved in trafficking persons. So that is something that is slightly more specific than in the Tanzania legislation. So our question uh, following this legislation review was, how aware are transport actors um, of this legislation that is in place? Are they aware of the consequences as well? Um, so that is something that we would like to look into in our research. Uh, next slide, please. So the legislation, uh, legis excuse me, the literature also focused on um, how the legislation is being operationalized. Um, 
And you can see here that Uganda and Tanzania are both uh, on the tier two watch list as graded by the US State Department, which means that there are significant efforts being made to combat trafficking in persons, but that the numbers um, are either high or increasing, or that there's a lack of evidence on steps taken um, to combat trafficking in persons. Um, what we've noticed in the literature is that there have been um, important steps taken to introduce anti-human trafficking machinery, um, which you can if, think about task force, uh, secretariat, coordinating bodies. Um, however, there is a low prosecution rate and conviction rate um, in both countries, which uh, does make a lower risk for traffickers um, uh, to carry out the human trafficking. And some, what we also notice in the literature is that some trafficking cases are actually being prosecuted as other crimes. So instead of being prosecuted as human trafficking, they're being prosecuted as uh, maybe the exploitation of labor, um, illicit you know, sexual activities, something like that, instead of the actual um, trafficking. And the literature also found that the fines are an ineffective deterrent um, for traffickers and those involved in trafficking, um, which may be compared to, for example, um, imprisonment. And we realize uh, as a team that there are other factors as well that are um, affecting the opera opera operationalism of um, this legislation. For example, um, the free movement that is in place um, between um, EAC countries and also um, a rapid urbanization trend is something that also might be contributing to um, the hindrance of operationalizing this legislation. Next slide, please. So when we focused on the specific transport findings um, within trafficking, human trafficking literature, um, we unfortunately found that very few resources explicitly and um, substantially focused on transporting um, during trafficking or on the role of transport actors um, and how they facilitate um, human trafficking. If, traffic, if transport was mentioned within the literature, it was normally to discuss what modes of transport were used, what routes were taken, um, or, or talking about the victims. Um, and it really lacked a lot of detail about the exact um, activities relating to transport. The kinds of transporters that were mentioned um, in literature were most often um, the service providers. So for example, long distance um, public service vehicle operators like buses, um, truck drivers, um, and other also private transport operators like boda bodas, pickup trucks, um, or any other kind of private hire vehicle. Next slide, please. So one thing that we're really missing within the literature in our team found is the is kind of the missing interactions uh, in terms of the tra transport sector. So we don't really have a clear idea on who plays what role. Um, the transport operators are usually just mentioned in passing. And so um, there is a, a, not a clear understanding of how the transport actors fit into the larger scheme of, of human trafficking. Um, there is more attention in the literature played, paid to um, employment agencies, crime syndicates. Um, often we, we came across um, recruitment agencies mentioned in the literature. Um, one other interesting aspect in the literature was that the transport operators, um, they were found to play a role in facilitating trans, trans, human trafficking, but they also created demand for trafficking by using services that were offered by, by trafficked victims, such as uh, those offered by commercial sex workers who had been trafficked. Um, and it also mentioned that not all transport is organized by traffickers. So sometimes the, the victim themselves were expected to make their way to a destination. Um, and so this made it clear that, um, you know, that importance around um, transport actors being aware of, of human trafficking and how to uh, correctly identify victims was, was very clear. So um, we did, discuss amongst our team, you know, why are transport operators only mentioned in passing? And uh, as, as we've just touched on now, transport is, uh, could be potentially arranged informally. So um, it might be 
um, an unknown aspect or it might be something that's not, not immediately clear or transport providers may not um, be deeply embedded within the crimin criminal, criminal networks that the literature research has focused on in the past. Um, so this is definitely an area that needs research, additional research. Uh, next slide, please. So why is um, the focus on transport so important um, within human trafficking uh, is because some victims uh, may be unaware that they're being trafficked or they're about to be trafficked during their journey. Um, and actually, it has been um, mentioned in literature that the transit phase of trafficking is where victims will start to realize that um, they are being trafficked. And they may this may be the first phase where they start to suffer physical, mental or sexual abuse. And so it's really a critical stage um, for intervention. Um, also, some of the transport operators that are involved in, in trafficking um, are linked to large crime syndicates um, and some have been allegedly run by high-ranking officials. Um, we are aware that there is obviously some risk in, in this sector, in researching this sector, um, and there might be some constraints in engaging with them. So that might also have been a challenge for research in the past, um, just a lack of ability to engage with um, important um, actors within this sector. Um, however, and there's also not yet really a strong call within the literature about the need to work within the transport sector to address trafficking. And um, I think that is where our research is really trying to show that we need to build awareness and understand the system as a whole. Um, and transport is a very important aspect of that. Next slide, please. So we, of course, uh, find ourselves in unprecedented times. I'm sure almost all of you have, have um, been impacted by COVID-19 over the last few months. Uh, and the human trafficking sector is no different. There has been some early emerging literature in this, um, on this topic, and they are currently focused on the increased vulnerability of people to, to trafficking. Um, however, there has not yet been any literature that specifically relates COVID-19 and um, transport in relation to human trafficking. Um, however, some of the push factors, for example, um, of human trafficking, um, such as poverty and un unemployment, is something that uh, we're very aware of that might be uh, making human trafficking more, um, more increasing the number of people who are vulnerable to human trafficking. Um, and especially in a situation of migrants, both formal and informal migrants might become more vulnerable to trafficking. Um, they may have, formal migrants may have restrictions on visas um, and, and may face job loss, so might have, have trouble finding um, formal work. And also those migrants that um, are abroad, they, they might face closed migration routes, so the inability to travel and also vice versa, those are wanting to migrate might be facing closed migration routes. And a lot of uh, jobs might have to move underground due to restrictions put in place by COVID. Um, also school closures um, and family economic pressures um, puts um, a lot of pressure on children and makes them more vulnerable to, to trafficking in persons as well. So this means um, increased risk to sexual exploitation, forced labor, um, and, and forced marriages as well. And for those victims that are have already been trafficked, there's likely a lack of access to um, sensitization, um, prevention info, uh, prevention materials, and they might be exposed to, to more unsanitary conditions. So putting them at a more at a higher health risk. Um, and the organizations that were once working in in, in human trafficking, you know, they might be also facing restrictions on what they're able to do in the field due to COVID-19. Um, and then turning this um, around, something that's not yet researched, but that what we would like to look into is, is the role of the transport sector um, during COVID. Um, we've seen that transport actors are facing a lack of access to essential services, um, you know, delays at border control, new regulations about isolation within cabs. Um, so this might put um, long distance drivers and heavy good vehicle drivers at an increased 
uh, risk of engaging with trafficking. So that's something that um, we would like to, to explore within our research. Um, next slide, please. So just to tie all of this together, um, our research team, after um, reading the literature that was available to us, um, identified several gaps um, within the literature. So these are things that we are considering addressing within our, our research. So first of all, the, what is the role of transporters in human trafficking? Um, how are victims recruited? And, and also the transport actors, how are they recruited? Who they work for? Um, what motivates them, what can they gain from these situations, what are their perceived risks, and how do they fit in with a wider network um, of, of trafficking actors. Also, uh, what is the role of long distance versus short distance transport operators um, in, in trafficking in persons, so both domestic and transnational um, trafficking in this case. What um, are the perspectives of policymakers um, in how to reduce trafficking in persons along um, high volume transport corridors. And if these are addressed, would that shift the problem elsewhere? Uh, what is the extent to which drivers and other transport staff facilitate uh, facilitating trafficking in persons are acting independently or with the knowledge of um, or compliance of their employers? Um, so is this something that is being done um, by drivers alone or is their entire company aware of it, for example? Next slide, please. Um, also, some things that we found that were missing in the literature were, you know, what is the volume of, of human trafficking along long distance transit routes particularly? Um, are they using um, these routes to and to what extent? Uh, and this would then inform us as well as where our pilot interventions could potentially have the greatest impact. Um, so that's a very critical question for us. Also, um, understanding the um, transport sector actors of the transport versions within the, the trafficking legislation um, and also the policy maker perceptions on how transport related provisions of anti-trafficking legislation can be operationalized, um, either operation, operationalized um, to a higher degree or operationalized in different ways. Uh, finally, the what is the potential role of transport associations and unions in uh, overcoming human trafficking? What are the opportunities and constraints of working with these organizations? Um, obviously, transport associations and unions play a very large role in the transport sector. Um, with drivers um, and also with the greater transport organizations. So very important in involving them in this, in this research. Next slide, please. And then we reach our final slide um, relating to the gaps in literature. So um, we would, another gap that we've um, observed is what is the victim's experience um, of the transport phase of trafficking? and how has this impacted um, their health, well-being, and security. Um, so focusing very much on the earlier stages of trafficking then for, for victims um, instead of um, the later stages where they have successfully been trafficked. Um, and then very relevant to this, this time period is, is to what extent COVID-19 is affecting um, transport sector operators who are involved with trafficking and as well um, the victims experiencing experiences of transportation um, during COVID-19 and how this might have been changed. Um, and then finally, the awareness of communities who are living along high volume transport corridors um, of the scale of, of human trafficking in their area, the processes that take place, um, you know, the role of different actors and also the role of the community themselves in facilitating this process. So these are a lot of questions um, that are left to be answered, and we we really do hope that our research can start to address um, can address some of these questions. So I'd like to pass it back over to Kathy, who will now explain a bit of what our next steps are um, and a little bit of insight into our primary research. Thanks very much, Kim. Next slide, please. 
So some very, very interesting findings there, um, we think. Um, so next slide, please. So what are our next steps? Um, the next step really is to design and implement some primary research um, so that we can start to look at some of these questions. So what we're planning to do um, is to carry out a, a series of key informant interviews. Um, so they will be qualitative interviews um, with a range of um, different cadres, so policymakers, transport companies, transport associations, driver training schools, and of course, civil society organizations who are working in this space. Um, we're also going to be designing a survey um, and undertaking some detailed case studies um, of some key respondents. So those will include long distance truck, bus and coach drivers, some of the other transport operators, operators that we've been mentioning, like the Boda Boda riders and other taxis. Um, we're going to be talking to victims and survivors and also the communities at the truck stops, at the cross-border checkpoints. Um, so these are the communities that live by the um, high volume traffic roads. Um, and finally, police, custom and immigration officials and border patrol officials. So these are the um, key uh, respondents um, and uh, focal persons for our interviews. Next slide, please. So, just to summarize um, the research topics, just to distill it down into you know, five or six key areas, we're gonna be looking at the awareness of trafficking in persons. So the forms, the push and pull factors, the scale, the routes, the impacts, um, and the availability of victim services along those routes. We're gonna be looking at um, the, um, people's understanding of the role of the transport sector in human trafficking. Also, if an individual is involved in trafficking, um, what their role is in detail, their motivation, the benefits and the risks um, based on their own perceptions. Um, we're gonna be looking at the impact of COVID-19 on trafficking in persons along the high volume transport corridors and also at cross border posts. Um, and also knowledge of um, legislation and what it says about transport, so the transport related provisions of the human trafficking legislation. Um, and then also finally ideas about the potential role of the transport sector and transport sector actors in helping to combat human trafficking. So we're starting to think about the locations of the research. Um, we have a few examples here. Um, and just to say we're at an early stage with this, uh, we need to pin it down a bit more. And we're hoping that some of the stakeholders on this call um, and also after the call can help us pin this down a little bit more. Um, but the key locations so far are the Central Corridor, um, which joins Bujumbura and Burundi to Dar es Salaam. Uh, the Northern Corridor from Kigali to Kampala, then on to Mombasa. And then some branch roads off the Dar Corridor, the Dar es Salaam Corridor, which goes south um, down through um, Zambia. Um, and we've put some examples there of particular sites. So in relation for, to the Northern Corridor, for example, we've got Bustio and Malabar, um, which are on the Uganda-Kenya border. We're very well aware that there's been quite a bit of research um, focused around Busia. Um, so far. Next slide, please. So how can you help? Um, so we're really asking stakeholders on this call whether they can help us with key contacts. Are there any individuals or organizations that you feel we really need to talk to? Um, earlier, we, we put up um, some tables showing you know, some of the organizations we've contacted already. Um, and that information will be supplied to attendees after this. So please do check through that. If there's anything obvious missing, then please do let us know. Um, if you have any unpublished or other reports or data, particularly reports and data that are hot off the press, we'll be really interested to see that. Um, if you have any information on trafficking hotspots, and we're particularly interested in, in what the civil society organizations working on human trafficking have to say on this issue. Um, we feel that you, you will know where these hotspots are, and um, particularly on the Northern Corridor from Kigali to Kampala and also the Central Corridor. And also, you know, do you have any information on the hotspots that are there, but you feel are, are understudied? Um, and, you know, do you feel that we should sort of focus on, on some of those? 
Um, we're going to be asking um, CSOs um, if we can gain access um, to human trafficking survivors. Uh, we want to be able to follow you know, ethical research um, considerations here and interview survivors in a safe space. And we feel that CSOs who are already working with survivors may be able to help us provide that. Um, and then lastly, um, we're asking whether uh, there are any participants on this call who would be interested in being involved in um, our strategy res research, our research strategy development process. Um, so we're hoping to form a reference group and that group will be meeting in October um, and we'll be looking in detail at the research uh, methodology, the research tools that we've come up with and we'd really like um, some volunteers to join that group. We have a couple already, um, but we'd really like a few more. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm going to hand over now um, to Damon Romara, who's from the Uganda Child Rights NGO Network. Um, and Damon is going to make a few comments based on the findings of the literature review um, and the rest of this session. So over to you, Damon. Thank you very much, uh, Kathy and uh, the team. Uh, good morning to each and every one of you. Uh, my name is uh, Damon Wamara. Currently, I'm the Executive Director of Uganda Child Rights NGO Network, um, a network of over 200 child rights focused organizations. And, and I am also a member of the advisory board of the Uganda Coalition Against Trafficking in Persons. And uh, my work with uh, children and child protection, um, especially in the area of uh, child trafficking, has uh, exposed me to many of the issues um, in terms of transportation of uh, children, but also the exploitation of children. Um, when I still worked with uh, dwelling places, that was definitely very active in uh, fighting and um, promoting the child protection and ensuring that children are protected from being violated, especially through trafficking. We found that engagement of uh, the transport sector was uh, not really um, heavy and was not, nothing was really being done in that respect. Yet when you look at the prevention of the trafficking in persons law um, that Uganda operates on, you find that um, the definition which is derived from the uh, Palermo Protocol is that we are uh, the definition of trafficking in person is the transportation recruitment um, as, as the action and the means you look at the, the coercion, the fraud and, and, and uh, the deception and abuse of office. And then finally, you look at the purpose, the real reason as to why it's going to be done, which is about uh, the final uh, result is for purpose of exploitation. And we find that many of the organizations uh, that we are working with are some delivery driven. And so they're working a lot in terms of responding to victim assistance, responding, um, like Alia mentioned, by Tim and Kathy to uh, ensure that the, the victims get justice and, and ensure that um, the, 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 um, the perpetrators are arrested and uh, prosecuted according to the law. But um, not so much was done in regards to engaging with uh, those who are unknowingly participating um, in being perpetrators of uh, this fight. And I think this research coming forward is going to help us um, show, um, give us direction as CSOs working in the field and give us an analysis of how we can better engage them, but also um, help us understand the roots and the trends and, 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 and the level of of, of investment and knowledge that the people in the transport industry have. For, for me, who is one of the people that I know will be an end user of this report, I think um, it's very key and it's a big gap. My experience with working with transporters, um, the little experience working with transporters, especially working through the Transport Licensing Board, is that we have seen a willingness of transporters not even knowing that they're perpetrators, not even knowing that they're actually contributing to um, this vice of um, trafficking in person. So this report is long overdue, and uh, I mean this research is long overdue. And like I've already mentioned, there's so little research, so little information, 
we hope that we can be able to gather the information from the, uh, I mean, we can be able to use, utilize this information in our programming and also uh, look at how we can better engage the transport industry. We need to engage them because one way or another they contribute. Um, I, I was telling the team that these, the, the victims don't just fall out from heaven into the exploitation part, into the exploitation port. They are transported. And so if we can engage the transporters, we can actually see how they can be involved rather than being victims or rather being perpetrators, how they can be part of the prevention of uh, trafficking of persons in Uganda. Um, I think those are the key things that I'll share today. I'm looking forward to this report. I can't wait to see what uh, Sam and the team have for us. And hopefully, um, we will also pick a few notes on how to better our programming as a uh, civil society. Thank you very much. Thank you, Damon, um, for those remarks. Um, very motivating uh, to know that there's uh, such a call from people like yourselves for so to fill this gap and, and hopefully we'll do our best to, to fill that gap as part of this research project and uh, also thank you to all the presenters today for for the information you've uh, shared uh, before we go into the questions uh, section of today um, by the way I'd like to encourage you to continue sending questions or comments um, please do I'd like now to invite the Honourable Joy Kabatsi um, the Ugandan State Minister for Transport to offer some closing remarks. Thank you, Minister. Okay, I think we might be having some technical problems, in which case, uh, maybe let's jump to some of the questions. Um, and and maybe we could come back to the minister at some point when those uh, connection problems are sorted. Um, we've been getting a number of questions and comments from you throughout. Um, so I think it's about time we probably started responding to some of them. So my role today will be to apportion some of those questions to the team and, and we'll also invite some of the team members who are on the call today to, to contribute to this discussion, those who haven't had the chance to present. The first question, um, when we talk about high, trans, uh, high volume transport corridors in East Africa, the Northern Corridor is right up there. However, Kenya is not included in this study. Why so? Uh, and I'll answer that. Um, obviously, you'll have seen as, as the presentation progressed that the Northern Corridor is very much recognized as a, as a key transportation route, uh, albeit Kenya not being one of the, tar uh, the target focus countries, um, Uganda and Tanzania. Basically when we were designing this program we felt that Uganda and Tanzania spoke uh, better to our strengths as a team. Uh, we've all been working in, in both of those countries for, for over a decade now. We're, we're fairly embedded within the transport sector within those two countries. Um, and therefore, it being a, trans, uh, a specific focus on the link between transport and human trafficking, we felt in a stronger position to actually bring about sort of engaging with the sector, engaging with transporters, engaging with transport associations. Um, and we, we sort of felt that the results would be stronger. Obviously, many of the recommendations, uh, while con context specific, will also be replicable uh, within a broader sphere. Um, we're also talking a lot to the EAC as part of this program, which obviously would affect uh, Kenya. So we, we will certainly bear your concerns in mind um, and uh, share what we can on that particular subject. Right, let's go to the next question. Actually, um, I'm just going to ask Minister Kabatsi, are you there? And if so, would you mind turning your video and microphone on? I think you can do so manually by clicking the unmute button and the camera button. Yeah. 
No. I think we're still waiting for the collection connection to to heal itself. Um, right. Second question. Uh, the term transport operator, widely used when describing the transport industry, is not helpful when attempting to analyse uh, the trafficking in persons, as it does not distinguish between vehicle owners and the workforce. How is the study taking care of these complexities? I think possibly the, the answer to that question has been already presented to you um, as part of the sort of information around research methodologies, but I'm also going to ask uh, any member of the team to, to respond if they have any further comments on that. And I'm going to go to Neil, Neil Retty, our transport specialist, please. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, something we need, we need to look into is like, ownership of the vehicle, driver of the vehicle, who's being held liable. Um, I think, you know, for the commercial enterprises, especially with the EAC law just waiting to come into force, um, that's going to then bring onus onto the vehicle owner. Um, the transport carrier, so they need to take efforts um, to mitigate the opportunities drivers can have to transport um, um, or traffic people. Um, so it is it is a key thing we'll be we'll be looking at and investigating during this project. Thank you, Neil. Um, links to that actually, what you just mentioned. I'm just going to pass another very quick question to you. Um, how does the pending EAC legislation fit with the existing legislation in Uganda and Tanzania and, and what will it do to strengthen that legislation at the moment? And if I could ask you as well, Neil, for that question. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, the EAC legislation will, will certainly um, enhance um, the laws in, in, in each country. That It is that much more strict. Uh, sorry, excuse me. <coughs> as just mentioned, um, there's more onus on the transport operator. Um, there's legal um, liability on him or her um, if their vehicles are used. The, the penalties are stricter. Um, currently, I think Uganda's um, got like a five-year prison sentence for involvement in trafficking in persons, and the EAC is looking at a minimum of 10 years. Um, I think I think Tanzania was about seven years in, in their law. So it is it is bringing in uh, stricter punishments, and it it is bringing in um, a wider look at the transportation of people being trafficked, um, and bringing putting the onus on the companies as well as the driver themselves. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, I have a question regarding disabled and special needs persons who are trafficked to Kenya uh, to beg on the streets, and we are concerned about the high number of victims in the streets of Nairobi. I, th I think there's a question there, uh, or it's, a, it's at least a comment, and it's certainly something we've been finding in terms of uh, both transnational and, and domestic trafficking in persons in, in Uganda and Tanzania. Um, Kathy, do you have any comments on, on that particular point? Yeah, I mean, it, it was a piece of um, research that we picked up in a couple of newspaper articles, actually, um, a, a flow of disabled children across the border at Busia in particular, um, and then onwards to Nairobi. Um, a lot of the children are used um, for street begging purposes, um, quite shocking. Um, information actually. Um, so I, I, I guess, you know, when we're looking at, um, you know, the, the shape of the human trafficking, we'll be looking at, you know, all sorts of different types. Um, so I think, you know, if some of our search uh, research was focused on Busia, we would definitely be picking this up. So thank you very much for pointing that out. You know, we are certainly aware of it and quite shocked by it. Um, and, and hopefully we can, you know, look at that in a little bit more detail during our research. Thank you, Cathy. Uh, another question has just popped in. Um, a combination of a fast growing population and, increase, and an increasing rate of rural urban migration 
could result in an increase in the population of Uganda's cities from 6 million today to more than 30 million within the next two decades. Has this work considered quantifying the impact of rural urban migration to the topic at hand? Um, and actually, Cathy, I'm going to pass this back to you. It's slightly in, in a way veering away from the subject of, of transport and transport corridors as, as a means to, to traffic people, but certainly the growing rate of urbanization, not only in the major cities, but also the regional and, and district cities, uh, certainly, I guess, will have an impact on uh, the number of people being trafficked from, from, rural, from a rural to an urban context. Yes. yes, certainly. Um, I mean, it's something that we have looked at in the literature review um, as, a, as a theme. Um, so the rapid urbanisation, the huge movement um, of rural residents into urban areas in both um, Uganda and Tanzania, it's very, very significant. So um, that issue will play a very important backdrop to our research. Um, in terms of kind of quantifying, um, it's going to be you know, quite difficult to quantify, you know, uh, the amount of trafficking in persons that's happening through various points. I mean, we're certainly trying to do what we can in that space. But I, I think with the issue of um, urbanisation, you know, that's an important co contextual factor, which we'll certainly take into account. Thank you, Cathy. Uh, there's an interesting one here, actually. To what extent do you think IGAD, which is the uh, intergovernmental authority on development. Uh, to what extent do you think IGAD might play a role in this as well? They have a strong focus on combating human trafficking uh, as well, as far as I'm aware. And that's a really good spot, actually, because I, I think our focus at the moment has been on engaging with national governments in Uganda and Tanzania, um, and also uh, regional in terms of the East African community. I suspect actually at the moment we don't have a link at IGAD, um, unless I'm incorrect, I'm looking for notes within the team. No, we don't. So uh, thank you for that. We will definitely take a note. Um, obviously it's a, it's a sort of a trade body. I don't think if my memory serves me right, Tanzania is in is involved in that block, but Uganda certainly is, so so thank you for that. Heads up, I'm going to move to the next question. Uh, thank you so much team, we look forward to the report. I'm wondering if the survey will also include commercial sexual exploitation of children as a form of TIP. Uh, and just to answer that, just to bring you back to the title of the subject, Certainly, uh, we're looking at all types of transport uh, trafficking in persons, but particularly in terms of that journey from, from source to destination, the transportation element and, and the use of transport corridors. So we almost certainly will be dealing with this particular subject, with, but very much with an emphasis on, on the transportation. Uh, here's a question specifically for Kim and Kathy. Um, is there a risk of conducting the study during COVID-19? As current impacts on borders, transit routes may not present a full review of the current situation, will there be a follow-up post-COVID-19? Kim, as a senior researcher, I'm going to pass that one to you if that's all right. Yeah, thanks, Sam. And, and it's a very relevant question, and we have very much taken it into account um, as we develop the research. We think that um, there will there is a large possibility of, of some of the routes um, being affected uh, by COVID-19. I mean, at border posts, there is increased scrutiny oftentimes now of drivers and of trucks, um, potentially also of buses. Uh, much stricter regulations in terms of, of movement of people. So it, we are aware that this might present as a bit of a, um, a change in scenery in terms of the, the trafficking circumstances. However, saying that, it's also 
very relevant at this time to investigate what the effects are of, uh, of a pandemic on, on how human trafficking operates. Um, we're not sure how long COVID-19 will be impacting um, the regulations in countries and there will surely be uh, you know, future crises as well that, that need to be accounted for. And so it is actually a very rare opportunity to, um, to investigate what some of these impacts might look like. Um, and I don't uh, believe that we will, at the moment, we don't have any plans to conduct research following the COVID-19 um, pandemic, also considering that we don't know when um, this will um, end. But I do think that we will be taking it into account and also investigating how people have perceived changes um, comparing prior to COVID-19 to the current situation. So that is definitely something that we will be including in our research. Thank you very much, Kim. Uh, are you also researching on the route from Burundi to Western Tanzania, uh, or vice versa, as a result of the political instability? We, we will certainly actually be finalizing the specific locations that we intend to target, based to some extent, as, as Kathy asked, um, in terms of the group support to, to, to identify hotspots, much of the feedback that today's audience and, and the other stakeholders that we've been engaged with will, will go some way to defining the, the target of the target locations of the research. Um, whether we probably won't venture into Burundi, um, as, as we mentioned before, very much the, the focus here is, is Tanzania and Uganda. But uh, certainly that corridor and up to the border uh, is within the realms of possibility in terms of us being able to target it. So I think uh, please feel free, whoever asked that question, to, to input that information in more detail. Uh, contact one of the team and if you'd like to sort of influence that uh, part of identifying that as a, as a key hotspot, then please, please do so. Uh, another question. Development partners are key players in the transport sector in both countries, funding up to 50% of the infrastructure works in transport corridors. Have they been considered as key stakeholders such that some of the recommendations arising out of this work would be readily implemented through the operations and frameworks? Uh, and the, the, the very brief answer to that is, is they definitely have been. We, in fact, we have some people on the call uh, representing the World Bank in Uganda and Tanzania today. Uh, we have the African Development Bank, uh, both of whom uh, contribute a huge amount of funding to, to transport infrastructure and have supported the development of tra transport corridors over the years. So uh, we certainly are engaging very closely with those particular stakeholders and will continue to do so. Next question. Uh, might there be an opportunity for this research to influence EAC le uh, legislation or are we too late? Uh, my understanding, and I'm going to pass this, ask you for a comment on this, Neil, but my understanding is uh, the current EIC, EAC legislation is pending and, and ready, uh, ready to go as soon as it's brought forward for assent. Um, we're not quite sure what the delay has been on that, but um, it might be the too late a stage, but uh, Neil, maybe you've got a, a more in-depth form, a more sort of informed comment on that particular point. Um, I have to apologise, I missed that. I'm trying to arrange the Minister's speech. So could you oh, repeat quick, that? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, might there be opportunity for this research to influence the 2016 EAC legislation or are we too late? Um, I'd say we're, we're too late. It, it, it's been approved by the East African Legislative Assembly and it is now just awaiting signatures by heads of state. So it's finalised. I think there's, it's too late to change that. Um, in the future, yes, I suppose it can be amended and improved upon. But I think at the, at the current moment, no, it's too late. Okay, thank you. Um, but 
Uh, just to reassure the, the asker of that question, we, we will obviously be engaging with the EAC throughout. Um, so if the opportunity to influence future legislation arises, uh, we will certainly be on that. I'm going to just break now because I believe the Minister is not able to join us. However, uh, Immaculate uh, Natukunda from the uh, Transport Licensing Board in the Ministry of Works and Transport in uh, Uganda, uh, I believe is intending to read the Minister's speech on her behalf. So Immaculate, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Good morning to you all. Good morning, morning. Immaculate. Please feel free to continue. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. So can I start on the minister's speech right now? Please do, Immaculate. Thank that you. would be fantastic. Okay, fine. Thank you. Uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I am honored today to officially at the virtual launch of the new research project, whose main objective is Accurate. I think we appear to have lost sound from you. Perhaps it's, uh, it's a loose connection. Immaculate, hey, can you hear us? It's going to give uh, a few seconds to see if it corrects itself. If not, I have some more questions to, to go in. Okay, we'll give Immaculate some time to, to sort out the, co the connection there. Um, in the meantime, uh, we have another question. Uh, WHO Uganda appreciates the invitation to participate in this eye-opening and informative webinar. Thank you, WHO Uganda. Uh, the usefulness of this information will enhance cross-border surveillance, including transmission pattern and contact tracing for better COVID-19 response. So WHO Uganda, thank you very much for that comment. I, I don't think there's really a question there, but we certainly hope to, to live up to, to your aspirations and, and certainly to, to contribute to, to the work that you do uh, and continue in, in the vein of, of sharing the findings uh, as we proceed with this project. Just checking with Immaculate once more. Immaculate, uh, can you hear? Are you able to speak? I think Immaculate is still frozen for now. Uh, question, do you expect the individual countries to revise their legislation in line with the EAC legislation once it's signed? Neil, uh, obviously you're our legislation expert. Um, okay. I wonder whether you can take that question. Um, my understanding is once the EAC legislation is signed into force by the heads of state, that then automatically supersedes the national laws. Um, whether then the national laws have to then be uh, brought in line with that, or it is just that law that's then enforced, I can't honestly say at the moment, um, but the EAC law will take precedence over current national law. Thank you. Uh, a question to Eva. How has the uh, stakeholder mapping process been so far? Um, what are the challenges that we've uh, encountered in, in the last few weeks as we've uh, set up the project and started engaging with people? Uh, thank you. I do hope that I got the question properly. Um, the stakeholder mapping process has not been very difficult, but there are some people that uh, or organizations that the research has reached out to, uh, but um, you know they you know they don't want to be very open about um, involvement and uh, what they do. We all know that uh, human trafficking is um, is is a space where you know, which is taken sensitively by some of these operators. 
but to be very honest, we are still continuing with the mapping. And as uh, some requested, if you have organizations uh, and people who can contribute uh, information and know-how in the, in the area of research, please, we would very much encourage you to uh, forward that information. But we are still reaching out to more and we hope to get a bigger number of stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. And just to add to that, um, we've been, I mean, we've been so impressed with the response. Uh, as I said earlier in my introduction, um, people's willingness to share and contribute to, to the discussion. Um, and I know we have a, a number of transport actors on the call today, transport associations uh, and private sector transporters, which is really encouraging to see uh, the industry engaging with this particular piece of research, which is a uh, really important for us, thank you. Um, a question, I'm gonna uh, pass this to Cathy, I think you're in the best position to answer this. How will you share uh, the results from this important research with stakeholders? Is there scope for any intervention slash pilot activity to address issues, the, the issues that you find? Yes, absolutely. Um, one of the phases of our research is a pilot um, intervention. So we'll take the findings of the literature review, the findings of the primary research, um, and then design a small pilot, um, which will hopefully have a you know a strong sort of transport um, focus. So it could be something like um, some kind of training for for drivers. Um, we know, for example, a lot of work has gone on in that space um, in the United States. There's a lot for us to learn from, from there. Um, so definitely a pilot will be a key focus of this piece of research. Um, as we mentioned earlier, um, we're hoping to set up a, a research reference group who will, help, who will help us actually sort of frame the research, design the research, and also for that group to be involved in the design of the pilot as well. And I think that's one of the kind of key ways in which we will really engage with key stakeholders to make sure that what we do has absolute relevance um, to you know, the, the country specific situations that we're working in. The final phase of our, um, of our research project as well has a big focus on dissemination. So we will have a series of workshops, meetings, dissemination events. Obviously a lot of what we're gonna be doing depends on COVID-19 um, and how that uh, pans out. Um, so we may find ourselves in a more of a virtual space where we're disseminating, you know, on a in a forum like this, or hopefully, you know, if all goes well, we can um, have face-to-face -face meetings. Very good question. Thank you for asking that. And yes, you know, I think just to em emphasise again that you know stakeholder involvement is going to be absolutely critical to making sure that our research and our intervention is, you know, entirely relevant and useful. Thank you, Cathy. Uh, another question, is there a possibility of including the routes from Ethiopia through Tanzania to South Africa? And very quickly to answer that, certainly, um, where those routes uh, overlap with the transport corridors, um, that will, of course, be possible and, and that will be our intention to do so. Um, we're, we're very aware of that route between uh, many of the people coming in from Ethiopia and Somalia with, uh, with a view to travelling uh, down to South Africa. So certainly is the answer to a very brief answer to that particular question. Uh, we have a comment. The Uganda Professional Drivers Network uh, is much willing to coordinate research with driver associations and driving schools uh, as target groups uh, since we coordinate a number of them. Thank you, Dennis. And I will see we know the UPDN uh, very well. Um, extensive links uh, throughout Uganda. In fact, we, we currently work with the UPDN on the delivery of uh, a COVID-19 response working with truck drivers in Uganda. So thank you for that comment, Dennis. Uh, another comment. Thanks, Sam and the team. A very informative webinar. As a major fleet operator, happy and interested to get involved when necessary no doubt onus on fleet operators freight forwarders uh, to ensure we are putting in the necessary preventative measures and training necessary thank you very much for that 
Uh, hopefully we we can identify who asked that question um, because uh, it would be great to work with you during this research. Thank you. Uh, another question. Uh, trafficking in persons is a very sensitive topic. How do you plan to engage interviewees to share their experience and knowledge? Oh, and uh, there is a, in brackets, it says to Eva. So Eva, I'm going to pass that one to you. Thank you very much. Luckily, um, we work with organizations, including the one that I, I serve in, uh, which are engaged with the communities along the transport corridors. So these are people that we already have engaged with in previously in other work. So we do not expect to find uh, or to experience a lot of challenges in reaching out to most of the, um, you know, the respondents and getting uh, good responses from them. We are aware, and thank you very much for that question, that uh, of course there will be impediments and all that, but uh, we have a skilled uh, group of um, um, uh, data collectors who are actually within the border areas and the transport corridors uh, targeted by this research. Thank you very much for asking that question. Thank you, Eva. Uh, another comment uh, from the Communication and Transport Workers Union in Tanzania. Uh, we are very happy to be part of this project. Thank you, uh, Kotwu. Uh, I was actually in your offices last week, so it was great to meet you guys. And, and thank you for that comment. It would be great to have your support. Uh, another comment here. Uh, this is Jessica from Dwelling Places. Hi, Jessica. I just want to commend uh, the team for the work on the research done so far. Really looking forward to understanding what motivates transporters to join trafficking in people, in persons. Uh, my experience in, in working with transporters has not clearly brought that out. Uh, thank you very much for this comment, Jessica. Uh, Jessica has been extremely helpful and communicative, uh, communicative over the last few weeks and it's really great to hear that uh, there's there's such support for for, for for sort of filling this gap sort of bringing transport into the equation and, and finding out what what really motivates that linkage in terms of facilitating trafficking in person so thank you for that comment jessica uh another question um did the literature review find anything about rates of prosecution under anti-trafficking laws. Cathy, are you in the best position to answer this? I think probably. Yeah, absolutely. Um, quite a few studies looked at the um, rates of prosecution. Um, so uh, yeah, wide range. Um, there is data um, year on year that we can, you know, we've been tracking. The rates are relatively low. Um, so Prosecution rates are relatively low, but also conviction rates are, are, are much lower than that as well. So, you know, I think there is a big gap between the estimated volume of traffic persons, um, how many go through to prosecution um, and how many end up as convictions. And I think that's something that um, came across in, in Kim's presentation earlier. But yeah, you know, hopefully, um, you know, as time goes by, those prosecution rates will, will improve and also convictions as well. And that would then obviously act as more of a deterrent to uh, would-be traffickers. Thanks for the question. It's a, a really good one. Thank you, Cathy. Um, I think if we're going to keep to time, we can maybe have one more question. Um, and this is to Kim. Uh, what so far from the find, what what so far are the are the findings telling you in terms of uh, in terms of how the transport industry can be brought into the this arena, made more accountable for its actions um, and and possible sort of uh, pilot interventions? We've sort of touched on that in terms of the presentation, but is there any space for elaborating on that, Kim? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think uh, the various uh, literature 
gave us hints towards this. Um, some of the literature did hint towards the awareness of drivers um, in, in their role in, in trafficking. Um, so I think in that respect, it will be very important um, to go beyond awareness raising and to really instill the importance of contributing to anti-trafficking activities and, and to emphasize their importance. I mean, they are very much a bottleneck to the trafficking of persons. So if they are more active in, in, in more aware of how they can play a role uh, in anti-trafficking activities, I think that will be very important. Um, but as we also saw, some, um, some transporters might not be aware. Um, and so I think that awareness raising around um, the incidence of trafficking and, and possibly um, looking into how to improve drivers' um, awareness around this and also, you know, working with transport associations around this just uh, and schools to instill that knowledge um, within the transport sector, I think is very important. Um, and then also, I mean, some um, aspects of transport are considered quite informal. Um, there are victims that are having to seek um, seek their own um, way forward in terms of transport. Um, and they may or may not be aware that they are being trafficked at this point. So I think that here, you know, if transporters can start to act as um, as a source of knowledge, I think that might be also, you know, one of the interesting uh, routes forward, um, um, especially, you know, really leveraging what I said earlier, that they are very much bottleneck um, to, to traffickers, uh, you know, prevention and then, and and moving on into the into the the victim space. Um, so yeah, I think that um, it's a very good question, and I think that the literature, um, just in our ability to identify these gaps, has has also presented many opportunities for where uh, we can move forward into that space. Thank you very much, Kim. Um, I've just been alerted that Immaculate from the Transport Licensing Board in Uganda is back online. Um, Immaculate, uh, would you be able to unmute and turn on your video? Are you there? Using my phone, let me try. Yes, I have unmuted myself. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Immaculate. Thank you. Actually, if it if it's, takes up less bandwidth uh, to keep the video off, then, then please feel free to do that. But. Um, if you wouldn't mind closing out the session with uh, the Minister's very brief speech and uh, it'd be fantastic. Thank you. Okay, fine. Uh, thank you very much. Unfortunately, I cannot get video option using my phone. Let me try. But if you don't mind to avoid uh, getting lost again, I would request that I read out her speech so that we don't lose the message that she was she wanted to pass across at this virtual meeting thank you Marika. please continue okay uh she asked me first of all to send you her apologies for being unable to be part of this meeting because she had to go away to attend to other equally important uh, uh, engagements uh, but I am happy I've seen uh, one of uh, my colleagues, Mr. Damon, whom we have uh, been working together with for quite some time, probably something around two years, uh, working on the issue of uh, trafficking of children. I'm sure he'll give you details of what we have done, and some of which, which will be included in the minister's speech. Uh, if you will permit me now, I will read uh, the, minister, the Honorable Minister's speech, verbatim. I hope I am loud and clear. Yeah. Okay, fine, right away. Uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I am honored today to officiate at the virtual launch of the new research project, whose main objective is to investigate the link between high transport corridors, long distance transport providers, and human trafficking in East Africa, with a view of identifying the existing gaps and developing recommendations about the role the transport sector can play in preventing human trafficking in East Africa. Uh, let me first take off, let me first of all take this opportunity to thank everyone who has joined us for this virtual launch. It is unfortunate that we have 
been unable to launch the occasion physically due to the existing pandemic, that is the one of COVID-19. We hope, however, that the scientists will soon be in position to provide solutions to the deadly disease, which has brought the whole world to a standstill, let alone many to, to the collapse of the global economy and the loss of many lives. We who are alive today also continue to thank God for the gift of life and ask for his continued protection from the disease as we continue to conduct our business and as solutions to the problem are being found so that normalcy can return. Uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, Uganda is one of the one of the countries in Africa where the vice of human trafficking is prevalent, both as a source and destinations for persons trafficked, for sexual exploitation and forced labor. The illicit trade is conducted both within and abroad. Uh, the biggest victims are persons from Karamoja, Napak, Iganga, and some other parts of northern East, northeastern Uganda. Most of the persons trafficked are children and women between the ages of 13 to 24. The children being sold off by their parents who are unable to cater for their welfare for a fee as long as uh, 20,000 Uganda shillings, which is approximately $5. Young women are the most vulnerable to transnational trafficking, usually seeking employment as domestic workers, and at times traffickers fraudulently recruit Ugandan women for employment and then exploit them via forced prostitution. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this, re this research study on high volume transport corridors and human trafficking in East Africa, therefore, comes at, at, at an opportune time to inform the likely impacts of transport on human trafficking. I am aware there are knowledge gaps with very little information available in academic research on the role of transport in trafficking in persons. I look forward to hearing the results of this research which will be important for policy making within the transport sector, as well as elsewhere to broaden preventive strategies used to combat trafficking in persons. Dear participants, trafficking in persons requires a multidisciplinary, multi-sectoral approach. It is important that key ministries, departments and, and agencies and civil society organizations work together to address this challenge. We cannot forget transport actors at different levels, such as transport operators, associations, and unions, who can play a critical role in this fight. The research will inform us in coming up with innovative ways on how the transport sector actors can help to prevent human trafficking. It is also important to adapt a regional perspective, since a great deal of trafficking in persons happens across borders. Ladies and gentlemen, whereas all this is ongoing, the government has made efforts to curb the malpractice. This has been done through a number of interventions as listed here below. Approval and publication of the Anti-Trafficking Act 2009, which prohibits trafficking of persons and also indicated the sanctions for the different offenses committed. Uh, training of more law enforcement officers to help in curbing the offense. Number three, investigation and prosecution of persons involved in the malpractice. Number, number four, establishment of an anti-trafficking desk in the Directorate of Public Prosecutions to expedite anti-trafficking criminal processes. Number five, Investigation and delicensing of fraudulent labor recruitment agencies. Number six, advertising the public, advising the public to seek employment in countries where we have bilateral agreements, ban on travel, or ban on travel to some countries, and also vetting of employment opportunities abroad. Uh, under the docket of the Ministry of Works and as Minister in charge of transport, the following interventions have also been done. There have been concerted efforts in scrutiny of travel documentation at all border points or parts of entry and exit to ensure valid reasons for travel. But you are aware also that there are some porous borders through which these trafficking, uh, uh, the traffickers uh, take their victims. 
uh, a regulation on transportation of school children by the ministry. The regulation on transportation of children uh, once passed will require persons traveling with, with or transporting children to obtain consent from the parents, guardians, and all local authorities bearing uh, the destination points and contacts of the same to enhance their safety. Uh, in, there is also increased sanitization, sanitization and awareness campaigns against the malpractice. Uh, number four, enforcement of the, prepared, of the preparation of passenger manifests to track the movement of persons using buses. Then there is also continued engagement with the transport operators and uh, continued strengthening of enforcement of the existing laws through increased coordination and dialogues with dialogue with key stakeholders. Uh, dear participants, as a leader and a minister of, of state responsible for transport, I pledge my support to the exercise and also to ensure that the policies, laws, and regulations that are in place are to put the malpractice to an end are adhered to. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as I conclude, I wish to thank our partners, the sponsors of this research, UK Aid, Commonwealth and Development Office, and all other players in particular, TransAid, North Star Alliance, and Northern Corridor Transit Transportation Coordination Authority involved in this research study. I look forward to receiving the findings and recommendations of the research in due course. For now, I urge each and every one of you to speak up against human trafficking in all its forms. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is um, my honor and pleasure to launch the research study on high volume transport corridors and human tra trafficking in East Africa and most specifically Uganda. I thank you for God and my country. Uh, dear participants, uh, that is the, those are the words of our Honorable Minister of State for Transport. I hope uh, I have been loud enough for everyone to hear them out. But I can also send you a soft copy of the same, if you so wish. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you very much, Immaculate. Uh, that was very clear, uh, and we appreciate you uh, reading the Minister's words out for us. And if you could convey uh, our thanks to the Minister as well for, for those words, that would be appreciated. Uh, right, we've, thank we've run over time. Thank you, Maker. Um, we've run over time, but uh, thank you. I hope it was of interest to you today. And thank you for your patience and for, for all the questions that you've sent in. We'll continue to keep answering them, uh, most likely via email. Uh, but please also keep sending questions in if, if you do have any. Um, everybody that's registered will receive uh, a link to the recorded version of this. So please also feel free to share that link with colleagues or other stakeholders who weren't able to make it today um, and also you'll receive a feedback form which we would be very grateful for if uh, if you manage to fill that out and send that back to us thank you again for attending uh, we look forward to communicating with all of you as we progress our research and have a lovely day everybody thank you thank you nice day mm -hmm. very much Thank you.